Welcome to Oshkosh. Welcome back. It's good to be here. Thanks for coming out. Um, so what we're going to do today is uh, I got a, a group of amazing pilots up here. We're going to talk about everything stole. And we're going to talk about how you get into it, why you get into it, who can get into it, what you need, everything to go through that. And we're going to base this on our, on our collective experience and kind of share our experiences with you guys and appreciate everybody coming out. Um, so I'll start with the introduction. My name is Ross. Uh, I am a private pilot. I live in Madison, Wisconsin. Uh, I fly an Aviat Husky, and uh, I've been flying in the demo the last couple of nights. If anybody's had a chance to come down and check that out, I'm the one that doesn't go backwards, and um, which is apparent. But um, so I have no. I just have a passion for aviation. I just love flying. Um, other than that. I uh, got into the low and slow thing uh, early on, and now I haven't had any desire to go anywhere else with it because it's just so much fun. So um, that's just a little bit about me, and I'm going to have everybody introduce themselves. Ryan, why don't you start off? Man, I picked the wrong seat. I have to go first. <laughs> well, I, I guess you know you what? We can send it, it to somebody. Why don't you Alrighty. just Alrighty. Well, uh, my name's Ryan Hunt. I live south of Atlanta, Georgia, and uh, I'm a commercial ATP pilot, fly corporate for a living, and... If it's an aspect of aviation, I usually like to get into it. So, uh, stole flying kind of fell into my lap a little bit. Um, a friend has a Carbon Cub EX2 that uh, he said, hey, why don't you go do some flying with me in it and started flying and figure it out and learning the aspect of it. And uh, it really impressed me because it's so applicable, you know, kind of everywhere. And I own a little J3 Cub with a 65, so, you know, no ball of fire, but at the same time, the aspects and the mechanics of it all fit in. So, uh, no, it's just a great little skill to have and develop, and I've uh, really been enjoying it. Hello, my name is Elaine Oldhofer Lang. I am from Platteville, Wisconsin, so just on the other side of the state, close to Dubuque, Iowa. I um, entered aviation as a college student. I'm a graduate of UW-Mankato, uh, or sorry, Minnesota State-Mankato. Yep. Go Mavericks. <laughs> and instructed for a while in Colorado, worked part-time um, doing that. Uh, had a job at Pilatus, moved back to the family farm in Wisconsin where we opened a small FBO flight school maintenance shop with my husband. We've been instructing and doing that for the last nine years and recently um, have gotten, gotten into more professional flying uh, have been flying for the state of Wisconsin in a Pilatus for the last two years, and I just earned my ATP multi-engine type rating in a Honda jet last week. So starting to start to, uh, to fly more professionally, but with the stole side of things, I have a stock 1977 uh, Piper Super Cub, and it's a good airplane. It's a great airplane. <laughs> we agree on that. There is no better airplane. There absolutely is not. <laughs> I beg to differ. Hi, I'm Richard McSpadden. I'm with uh, AOPA Air Safety Institute. Um, I fly a uh, Piper Super Cub, and uh, I flew GA in college and then uh, flew for the military, flew mostly fighters, a little bit of time in King Airs, and now I've been with AOPA for about five years. My name is Colin Keneva. I'm from Lincoln, Nebraska. I, uh, compared to all these guys' flying experience, I get to fly that green Cessna 182 out there, old green plane and uh, video myself and my partner Craig doing crazy stuff. And then uh, I also fly a Carbon Cub and uh, just recently started stole dragging that. got my card and uh, they called me and said, you should talk about stole. And now compared to these guys, I don't know if I should. Maybe I should just learn something. I beg to differ. I feel like the new kid on the block. Yeah. All right, well, thanks everyone. So I guess what I'm gonna do, Richard, if you can do me a favor and tell me why, after all of your experience, flying jets, flying all sorts of things, why do you have a Super Cub? Yeah, um, to me, it's just the pure essence of flying. You know, just about anybody who flies, this guy flies P-51s. Um, anything they fly, you know, if you talk to them about why they like to go low and slow and fly the airplanes we fly, it's just the pure essence of flying. And that's why I love it. You flip the mags on and you go fly and just get back to the roots of why it's so much fun to fly. I also find that this uh, kind of flying really helps improve your skills. So there's a lot of head work in this kind of flying. And that uh, translates also to, you know, you fly fighters in the military 
quite frankly, flying the fight, just flying it is the easy part. You'd probably say that flying the P-51. It's the head game involved in understanding the systems and employing the airplane. And that sort of head game uh, transfers over to this, and that, I like that a lot. Perfect. Perfect. So one of the other main things, though, is everybody goes on YouTube and they see people with, you know, they see carbon cups. They see Steve Henry with a nitrous system in his airplane. Do you, I mean, do you need that? Is that something that everybody needs for Stoll? Not at all. I, I first got into Stoll literally with that 182, and I was at Stearman, Kansas. And a guy, I asked him if I could land in their Stoll landing strip. And I think it was 265 feet or 300 feet. And at first they said no. And then he said, well, do you know what you're doing? And I said, I wouldn't ask you if I didn't know what I was doing. And so I stuck it. And then they asked me if I'd consider racing the 182 in, in a stole drag. And I was like, no. It, I think you, you, you fly what you have. I mean, we learn stole when you start getting your license. That's it. You're using all those same techniques. Yeah, so we, AOPA had a flying at Tullahoma, Tennessee. And uh, at the time, I owned a Navion, and I put the Navion in the Stoll demo. And uh, that Navion got a lot of attention because it's a four-place airplane. It's heavy. Um, and yet, I was taking off and landing that thing, a Navion, if you fly it really light, in about 600 feet. And it was a real eye-opener for people that a Navion could perform like that, which kind of goes to why this is fun anyway. It just really helps you max perform your airplane. You'll really understand how to fly your airplane if you get involved in Stoll. So once you figure out what you're flying and how you want to fly it and you want to get into the, the stole world, Elaine, as an instructor, as my instructor, what do you, what would you say, how, how do you start? So to kind of highlight what you get, these guys have already said, I think you can take just about any airplane and you can learn how to become a master of that airplane. You can learn how to operate it safely, but at you know the very limit of its abilities, and you can do that safely. And that's just what stall flying to me is all about. Whether it's you know a super cub or a carbon cub, you know that stalls off the airspeed indicator. Sometimes you don't even know how fast you're going, and that's just where its limitation is at. And you fly it that slow, and you you control and, and handle the airplane. Or if you're in a Piper Cherokee, I mean, with our students. When they get good before their private pilot rating, there's nothing I love to do more than say, hey, let's, let's go out and have a short field <laughs> takeoff and landing contest. And it's a part of the check ride. You have to demonstrate a short field takeoff and landing. And as you said with that Navion, you can get that little Cherokee in pretty dang short if you know what you're doing. And it's fun, and it's a ton of fun. So you can really, any airplane you want, it's just a matter of really getting to know your airplane, building proficiency, and getting comfortable operating it at that limitation. But I think, to her point, Stoll doesn't start on a, sto on a short grass strip or a sound bar like you see on YouTube. Stoll starts at about 3,500 feet in the air and, and get comfortable flying slow. And until you're really comfortable flying that plane at its envelope and, and you're getting good at managing the power and energy, I, I don't think I would want to hit a grass strip. I mean, I think Stoll starts at altitude. Yeah. And especially something that's, you know, not in your limits because I mean in Georgia we're really lucky we have grass strips everywhere and there's plenty you can go and practice on that don't necessarily require it but it's somewhere to kind of make you feel like because once you get and start learning that envelope because that's so much of it is keeping this airplane in its envelope and learning the envelope and you know it's all practice and, and the practice you know comes and polishes you more and more then you can come into say a 3500 foot grass strip if you know you have the ability to for uh, location-wise, and practice. And it feels, I mean, it kind of puts you in the scenario, and, you know, at that point you work on it, and you can, you know, even on a 5,000-foot grass or uh, concrete strip, you can really practice this stuff and, uh, you know, measure yourself or, or, you know, yourself by markings and everything. So uh, it's, it's just setting yourself up and practicing, polishing, and, you know, going out and doing it. Of course, and, and so actually, I'll keep you on the spot. What's the largest airplane you fly? Uh, Falcon 900. Okay. Any skills transfer from what you do in a, car, in a carbon cub or a J3? Without a doubt, because it boils you back down to the essence of flying. You know, the faster, slower, trees bigger, trees smaller, 
mentality and uh, it turns into energy management and it turns into feeling the airplane and then the jets they start to you know it, it feels like it numbs it but at the same time it doesn't so it's it's really easy to um, you know kind of get in a world where you're thinking you don't have to do it but it really does boil down into the same concept of uh, you know riding the energy and and things along that nature am I ever in a spot where I've got to you know put it right there on the numbers and max braking with full reverse as hard as I can no but you you've got that mentality and, and concepts to apply as needed mm -hmm. absolutely so from from my instructors up here what would you say to a new to someone who's new wants to get into stole as you said you know it, it starts up in, in elevation what is the what's the number one first thing that you should work on? So I actually agree that slow flight is an incredibly important skill. Um, the ACS got switched around and they don't have you demonstrate slow flight the same way that they used to. You used to be way behind the power curve in slow flight and now they kind of want you ahead of it. And a lot of stole flying is behind the power curve. So if you haven't ever done that, because maybe you've you know gone through your license recently, Find an instructor who's comfortable really getting the airplane behind the power curve. Practice slow flight that way, and just get up high where you're comfortable. You know, you have some altitude beneath you. You, you know, a nice day. Even brand new students, they they make so much progress when the airplane's not getting tossed around in turbulence and weather, and you're not fighting it. You know, like just set yourself up for the maximum amount of success and feel. Because you really have to become one with the airplane. <laughs> I know that sounds kind of funny, but it's, it's like you wear the airplane. It becomes an extension of you. It is literally like this beautiful like human-machine connection, and you have to develop that relationship with the airplane before you get it down low and you start, and you start trying to come in short. And, and take baby steps. Just you know, don't go out and buy yourself a brand new carbon cub and eye up that 300 foot strip and be like, well, here we go. <laughs> you know, What's start out, start out slow, start out slow, get consistent, become really accurate. You got to be able to nail it every time. Like just, just take your time, have some patience and you know, with practice and proficiency, then eventually you'll get there. What's that statement about eating the elephant bite at a time? It applies. I would say uh, don't forget to take off. So a lot of times when people think stole, they think landing, which is, you know, that's the most dramatic thing you see. But I'm a safety guy, so I can't help myself. I'm going to talk safety here a little bit. Um, the most uh, prominent place for a stall is in takeoff phase, takeoff, uh, departure, and um, uh, climb out. That's where most stalls happen. And so if you're involved in a stall competition, I like the stall piece because it helps me become a better backcountry pilot. So um, the takeoff phase of that, understanding how your airplane's gonna perform in different crosswinds, a lot of times in the stuff he's doing in stall drag, you're gonna be taken off uh, and w in, with tailwinds, taken off at landing with tailwinds actually. So understanding when you can take off with a tailwind and how your aircraft's gonna perform. So that would be my piece of advice is all this is good stuff too and don't forget to take off. Perfect. And so let's take it another step. So you're, you're out practicing for stall, and this is something that the Air Safety Institute and I worked on, a small video a couple years ago about going to the first event. How do you, how, each of you have now been involved in an event. When are you, how do you know that you're ready to take that next step and add that pressure of having a crowd present or having other pilots watching? Um, when, when, did, when would you know that you're ready for something like that? Well, in, in Stoll Drag, there is a, a course. It's, it's accredited now, so you have to take a course, and you have to uh, prove that you can do certain things. You can fly low in a crab and a slip. Uh, you have to demonstrate you can land on a point, turn around. So I, I think it's not up to you. I mean, anybody could say I'll enter the Stoll competition, but if something's not feeling right in your gut, chances are I probably wouldn't do it. I mean, that's kind of what it boils down to. But with a crowd, it's different. Yeah, and stole drag is another, I mean, because that's, I would consider that two, maybe three steps beyond what, you know, you might be doing with traditional stole, because you're adding so many variables, you're adding a tailwind, you're adding a turnaround, you're adding another airplane, um, which, and there, I, think, I think that's good that there are those kind of precautions in place so that people are qualified. But, you know, a lot of them, you know, especially as these things keep popping up across the country, there are 
you know, there, there aren't really any qualifications. A lot of people at airports are just throwing down a line. You know, how, are you, how, do, how do you get ready for that? How do you know? How do you know when you're ready? I think it's important is a third party helps you make your assessment. Because if I were to ask everybody in this room, how many, how many people are above average pilots, 100% of the hands would go up, right? Statistically, that doesn't work out, right? Statistically, half of us are below average. So as pilots, we tend to have an inflated point of view of our performance. So it's really important to have somebody with you, somebody that you can count on, either an instructor or uh, a good friend who's going to be really honest with you that says, um, you know, you didn't miss that landing by 50 feet. You missed it by 100. You were five knots too fast. You were, you know, giving you very objective assessment of your capability. It would be really helpful to you. Yeah, I think that's a really important point because, I mean, if you really boil it down, we always have a third party to progress in aviation, period. You fly with your instructor, that's one. Well, then do you do a check ride with your instructor? No, you don't. You have a DPE, and that's his job. And, and sure, we have those set standards, but it's still a third party member to, uh, you know, grade you on that. And I think that's a big point in it of... Uh, sitting there and having somebody come and look. And I, I know a lot of air show people do the same. They have somebody on the ground grading them. And it's, it's harsh and it's brutal, but it's what's needed. Because, uh, you know, I don't know that I'd ever sit there and dive out there and say, uh, yep, nope, I'm ready. Because I don't know. I mean, I always think I'm better than I am. And I know I'm in that 50% range. So, uh, you know, it's just, uh, I don't know. I, I completely agree. A third pot, uh, party is, is very important on that. Absolutely. So having taken those steps, having somebody that's going to watch you, let you know, hey, this is kind of where you're at, this is where I think you're flying, is, is, that, is that an instructor? Is that any instructor? Can you, I mean, can you grab just any CFI from any, any flight school, or is there a way that we can you know, find specific instructors that are going to know what to look for? I think you look for who's doing it. So, I mean, if you're... <laughs> If I'm going to go learn how to do aer uh, aerobatics, I'm not going to go over to the Stoll Corral, right? I mean, you kind of go where there's, there's events popping up all over the country. And if you don't think that Stoll pilots like to talk about being a Stoll pilot, it's kind of like people that do CrossFit. They'll tell you. Perfect. Perfect. Yeah. So um, these events that you're talking about that are popping up, where, where are they coming from? Are they all, I mean, how, how, do, you, how do you find them? How, how are you creating them? Yeah, I mean, you can find stole events all over. And the, the great thing about it is, is they're, they're starting to pop up more and more. Um, I help uh, plan and put on, a, I, I've been wanting to do a stole event for a couple years. And I was fortunate enough to have a couple guys in Wayne, Nebraska, they're actually in here, that run the airport. <clears throat> And they asked me if I'd help them put on a stole event. I was like, are you kidding me? I've been trying to do this in Lincoln for years. And so I think you just find like-minded people. And it's kind of weird how, how fly-ins, like this little fly-in called Oshkosh, brings together people like us that are all here doing the same thing. Right? And so we start talking. And next thing you know, we're putting on a stole drag. And uh, I, I just – but the, the good thing about – Stole is it's a little different than having an acrobatic show or an aerobatic show is because a stole event it is there's 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 things that you can do with a, a chalk line and you know of course you talk to your local fizdo and see what you can and can't do but they're all over they're popping up from the east to the west I wish there was actually more in the east it seems like more of the Midwest and the west so can we go back a little bit because I want I didn't chime in in time but like you just got typed jet typed in a Honda jet right. She wouldn't turn to that instructor and say, hey, come, you know, come check me out in, for Stoll in, uh, in her Super Cub, right? Totally different. So you ask the question, what kind of instructor do you need? Somebody that's familiar with what it is that you're trying to do because they'll just have different standards. Somebody in a Honda jet may be perfectly fine with you missing a landing spot by 100 feet, right? You can't do that in a Stoll competition or in the backcountry. So you, need to, you, you want to have somebody that's really familiar with what it is you're trying to do. Okay. Yeah. Absolutely. So what other areas of aviation can these stole techniques that we're talking about, um, you know, Ryan, how have you been able to apply them even more specifically, whether it's your, whether it's any of the warbirds you're flying or, um, or any of that, like, where, you know, these stick and rudder skills that we're using all the time? Well, it falls back into boiling down into the bare bone basics, knowing the envelope, knowing uh, 
what your airplane can and can't do. Uh, some of the Warbirds, you know, we don't ever push anything. I mean, at this stage, however, you can still use those aspects in order to, you know, really learn that envelope a little more. And that's where I use it mainly is for exploring envelopes of these new airplanes I fly. So, you know, we get and we go and fly a, a new type every now and then. Luckily, I'm, I'm very lucky in that sense. And when you understand how the envelope works, it's a lot easier to learn. And so I use mine and, you know, all the stole technique as uh, a learning tool primarily. And um, it's been a real joy to figure out, you know, what an airplane can and can't do. And do we ever, use, you know, do we push it every time? No, not at all. But it's a great, great tool to have. Awesome. Uh, I would also just um, back to the safety stuff a little bit is most uh, mishaps for corporate jets like these guys fly uh, happen because people come in too fast. They land too fast and they either get in some kind of porpoise or they run off the end of the runway. And that all has to do with very precise airspeed control, which Stoll teaches you. So, and Richard, so you've been spending a lot of time out west in, in the backcountry in your Super Cub this summer. What has, you know, what, what skills in the, in the slow flight, in short field, what, how is that all transferred over? Because there is a big difference between stole flying, backcountry flying, you know, and because not every backcountry landing is a short on the brakes locked up every time. Um, so how, how is that transferred over? What is, what are you using? What are you not using, uh, if anything, for technique? Yeah, I, I think the, uh, the key is, uh, being able to fly the airplane exactly where you want to fly it. And you don't always have to fly it on the ragged edge, and in fact, you really don't want to do that unless you need to, but sometimes you need to, and you have to be able to put the airplane there. And so we talked about exercises. A couple of my favorite exercises are, I'll go up in my Super Cub if I hadn't flown it in a while, and um, I'll just uh, do a bunch of stalls, in and out of the stall, on all configurations. No flap, partial flap, full flap. Then I'll go into turns, then I'll go into 45 degree bank turns, and I'm stalling in and out of it. And the key there is coordinated turns. Mm -hmm. so that's another thing you learn, right? Is you, it is very important when you're flying this slow at the speeds that you know, we're trying to fly to max perform the airplane, that you fly coordinated. Because if you don't, you make a mistake. It's really punishing. And the second is the drift exercise. You know, you fly down over the runway at very slow speed, just, just above touchdown. And then uh, it's okay if you touch down and you're well behind the power curve and you're drifting to the left center of the runway and you stabilize and you drift to the right center of the runway and you stabilize all the way down the runway. And that'll teach you how much aileron movement that you need to control that drift in there. So those are two, two of my favorite exercises that I've learned in trying to improve uh, stolen and backcountry flying. Are we going to bring the theatrics at every time we go to a show? When 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 us when when this panel talks? Yes, absolutely. Thank you. That is definitely what's going to happen. We appreciate that extra effort. <laughs> so, once you get past the the slow flight and the knowing the airplane, knowing the stall speed, what what's another what's another thing that somebody flying a 150, 152, 172 might go out and work on once they get more comfortable in the airplane? Um, what, what's the next step that I'm going to work on in, once I feel like I know where the airplane is at what speed? Uh, Elaine, what would, you, what would you recommend to a student to go out and practice next? I would say focus a lot on, you know what Richard said, just nailing those airspeeds and flying absolutely as precisely as possible. And don't give yourself a big tolerance, you know? Don't be like, ah, oh, it was 10 knots too fast on that approach, it was fine, you know? It, it's not okay if you're coming into a place that's too short. I mean, that extra airspeed can translate to you maybe running off the edge or, you know, something else. And, and it's, I think, just really important to, to keep yourself honest, hold yourself to really high standards, and fly with the absolute maximum amount of precision that you can, that you can do. And, and, you know, it includes maintaining really good directional control. I think the best thing about tailwheel flying or stole flying is you should be able to maintain dark directional control anytime in any situation in any wind. Um, and that translates well into flying any airplane because when you're sitting, you know, right or left seat with another professional pilot and you start drifting off the center line, that doesn't make them feel real good. Hey Russ, can I ask my fellow super cover a question? Go ahead. I, I wanna know how you 
how you rate um, the importance of feeling an aircraft, because you and I, our airplanes stall below the airspeed indicator, right? It's, it's off, you, you can't fly a speed at some point when you're doing stall in backcountry. So talk, talk about that, the feel of the airplane, and how important you think that is. I do think feeling the airplane is incredibly important, and I'm biased, but as an instructor and now flying more professionally, I fly with a lot of people, and you can kind of tell when they have a knack for that ability. You can tell when they can really feel the airplane and they're, they're a part of it. And you, you can identify that immediately. And when they have that man, I just feel great. But when they don't have that, I get a little nervous because they're just flying by numbers. You know, they're flying by air speeds. They're flying by what the book told them to do. And anyone can do that. But to really develop a true feel for the aircraft is pretty special. And it, it makes me think about um, several years ago, we had a PA-12, just a stock Piper Super Cruiser, no flaps. Good, honest airplane, but it's not a Super Cub. And we watched the short field takeoff and landing demonstration over at New Holstein. We went to the Super Cub fly-in. And Ed Doyle was there, and he was flying his airplane. He flies the snot out of that airplane. It was, it was absolutely incredible. And as a new aspiring stole pilot, I go up to Ed, and I'm like, Ed, that was incredible. How do you do it? And he goes, you know, I don't think I look at my instruments once. He's like, I just feel the airplane. He's like, I just know what it's doing. I know where it is. I know where it's going. I know what's going to happen next. And, and he just has such an intimate relationship with his airplane that he just feels it. And that just takes, I think, a lot of experience and a lot of time. So how often, how, do, how does that feel develop for you guys? I mean, and how long does it take? Is there an hour set to that? Is it... Uh, you know, because when we talk, we do talk a lot about feel, you know, feeling the airplane and listening to it is another term. I guess explain that a little bit more in your, in your perspective, whether, whether it's a Super Cub, whether it's a P-51, they, they all talk. I think in my, for my point of view is it's kind of like getting in shape. It's how, how, how long do you stay in the gym? How well do you eat? I eat, sleep, and drink. Stole. I love it. I love flying my, my carbon cub everywhere I go. I like looking at a beach and, hey, can I land on that? Fly over it two or three times and see. Um, pray that someone doesn't own it. And then, uh, yeah, I mean, it's just how often do you want to practice it? And that's, that's how good you're going to get. Because that guy that can fly it without looking at an instrument, I guarantee he's probably done, you know, there's days where he'll go out and he'll do 150 landings. And people think, oh, 150 landings? Yeah, I, I do it three times a week. Yeah, yeah there, was a, there was a really good golf coach a while, a while back, I Harvey, uh, I forget his name, but anyway, he said, I think he wrote a book even that said aim small, right? And what he meant by that is, uh, you know, aim, aim very precisely. And what I find is a Super Cub is a pretty docile airplane. It's pretty easy to fly. And people say, well, you know, how can you go up, because they'll see me go up and time after time, you know, 10 landings in a row, right? How can you do that? Because I'm not quite there yet. You know, I'm not quite at the level that I see that some people can fly a Super Cub, which is, you know, the difference of 100 feet maybe or the difference of putting it exactly where I want to. And to me, that's fun. And I think the answer to your question is just time and experience and feeling that and debriefing yourself. Like after every landing, I drifted 20 feet more than I thought I would. And as you're taxiing back, why? Why? It felt right. The speed felt right, you know? Yeah, and I completely agree with that last statement of a kind of self-debrief is, you know, that's how I feel I learn the best. And whether it's myself giving it to me or, you know, say, it's bad and I go fly, you're sitting there, hey, here's what this is. And, you know, you kind of work three knots fast here. We could have shaved a little here. I try to receive that as best as I can. You know, I love criticism because it's something to work off of. And then to go back to, um, you know, how do you get that feeling? Go and watch some of these great guys. How much are they flying a day? And I know some, sometimes that's hard, but they fly every day, every condition, every configuration, and they just repeat, rinse and repeat, rinse and repeat. They're always, oh, well, you know, I could have done that a little better. I mean, even if they are number one, there's always something to, you know, grade yourself on and uh, I always think that's really amazing to see these greats who are out there absolutely every day trying it. Yeah. 
And I have one more question that's going to be kind of flight school related. So as you're talking about, we're, we're talking about specifics, feeling airplanes, listening to them, stall speeds, et cetera. Let's say somebody that uh, is renting an airplane maybe through a flight school, 172, they just want to know the airplane better. They might be flying three or four, depending on what's available that day. Are those airplanes identical? They feel identical? No, every, every airplane is different. You know, I can tell you, uh, I, I may have mentioned, I, I think I did, that I used to fly fighters in the Air Force, and you'd think, those are all the same pretty much. No, they, they all have different characteristics. They all stall just a little bit differently at a slightly different speed, at a slightly different wing drop. So I find the differences in airplanes is her Super Cub from my Super Cub will be different. It'll stall a knot or two different, or it'll turn just a little bit differently. It'll need just a little more rudder or whatever the case is. And I think that applies on everything, 172s, everything. You, you could go out to every pair of airplanes here at Oshkosh, fly them both, and none of them will be exactly the same. Well, you just shot my dreams down because I thought I was going to go out and get to fly one of your warbirds. And Come on. <laughs> but it's, it's the same, right? I don't know which right? one we're taking, but we'll, <laughs> yeah. we'll do it. Yeah, well, that, uh, it's, it's all a lot of great insight, and, and it's something that people might not think about all the time. A 172 is a 172, but that is not the case. And, you know, like I said, my Husky doesn't go backward. It's a completely different airplane than Austin's. But they, they'll fly similarly, they'll perform similarly, depending on what's, you know, what the conditions are, but it, they're, they're all different airplanes. And so it's it really important, I think what it all boils down to, is just get really comfortable taking those baby steps and working into what, you know, where you want to get to. I would say, you know, getting into stole, you know, you may look at, oh, I want to do this competition here. I want to do this event here. Maybe, you know, wait until you're at that point, until you're feeling really comfortable enough. You're hitting that number every single time. And if you're not, you're having that conversation with yourself, bringing it back. Why, why did that feel different? Um, I know the group that I fly with, they break down everything. And so, you know, even if it's five feet longer, so I got a little push there, but you're paying attention to what, what the wind is doing, what the conditions are, what the density altitude is, because the airplane's going to handle differently no matter what the conditions are. And so you have to be ready for that. And once you're ready for that, then you're probably getting into that, I'm ready for a stole demo event, whatever it is. And one little thing on that, uh, talking about each one being different, let's boil it down to the 172s. You go and jump in a few 172s and you start learning that envelope and uh, I think there's something about flying a few different ones that actually helps. Uh, and that's been my experience where you kind of get to know how they're starting to feel and how they kind of trend and I don't know, I just I feel like you can kind of learn to read an airplane a little better when each one's a tad different and uh, just helps with the process. Um, so, Elaine, last night your landings were quite a bit shorter than mine. Um, why don't you walk everybody through really detailed what your technique is and what you're doing? Well, to start, you get a super cub. It's a good start. That's a good start. I'm kidding. I disagree. I, th I think the 182 is the best stole plane out there. Because <laughs> just look at it. You can load the thing down. You can get into the back country. That's really what stole is: is getting you in and out of the camping spot. But anyway, I digress. Go ahead. Oh, sorry. Sorry, Ross. I, you, don't, you don't have to. I had to poke at you just a little bit. Um, <laughs> so, you know, as Richard mentioned, the takeoff is super important, too. And people do, you know, not give that enough credit. Um, I had the opportunity to instruct in Colorado for a few years. And that was a great learning experience being a Midwesterner at heart, right? You learn about density altitude really quickly when it's 90 degrees in Denver and you have a 9,000 foot density altitude and your lightly loaded 180 horse 172 is climbing at 200 feet per minute. <laughs> and you, you learn that you need energy in that airplane um, before you can make it do anything. And stole flying's a little bit that way too. So, you know, the takeoff obviously is, is important. You need, to, you need to wait, you need to be patient, you need to make sure that airplane's flying before it's gonna do anything for you. Um, and, you know, a mistake we all make is sometimes we try to make the airplane fly before it's ready. <laughs> and it, it doesn't do it. It doesn't work. <laughs> and then with the landing, I guess, you're asking me to, like, talk you through it? I don't want to give up my secrets, Ross. Well, I know. That was half of it. But, no, I mean, I, are you looking for a specific number when you're coming around? 
Sure. No, you know, you, you know it's going to be good, I guess, when, as you're touching down. And it's just all about dissipating that energy. And I don't want to simplify it too much, but you really just got to bring it in as absolutely slow as possible. And you got to hit that spot as good as you can. And then you just got to, you just got to get on it and don't, you know, flip it over. Perfect. Well, I, as the safety guy, I like the last comment. That was a good one. Yeah. <laughs> Right, right, right. And if there's one thing I could do, it's probably push limits a little more. But I think that's a quality of a female aviator. I don't know. Well, if you're pushing the limits, I mean, how, how, how do you guys do that? I know, I know, I, know I, I mean, we talk about the baby steps. Because, um, you know, in, in other sports, whether it's motorcycles or, or whatever, like, you, can, you know when you hit the limit because you fall off. You're not going to get to the point where you're going to bend an airplane because that's... You know, that's taking it too far. Nobody can afford that. But how do, you, how do you just creep up on that? You know what, Ross? I think one of the hardest things to figure out in aviation is you can't get better unless you get outside your comfort zone, right? So how do you get outside the comfort zone but not so far that you lost a little bit of control there, right? So you got to be willing to push yourself a little bit with the ability to pull back if you had to. Where is that? I don't know, it's different for everybody on any different day, right? Uh, so um, that's the one that somebody has to develop a feel for themselves. And for all of us up here, I'd be willing to, to guess that we've all probably pushed it a little bit too far and gotten away with a, little, a couple of things here and there, you know, go, man, that was a little too far. Yeah, for sure, for sure. So it all boils down to just getting to know your airplane. Having fun flying, though, is the other important part because it is fun. It's the most fun flying there is, in my opinion. It's kind of the only flying I've done, but these people can attest to that. They've done everything else. Yeah, so. it's a ball. I mean, sit there and jump in the little J3 and, you know, no radio, stick and rudder, and that's all it is. I mean, it's just a hoot. The AOPA is such a great organization to help put these things together and get people involved in STOL. And then they had to end it by playing taps for us. <laughs> I feel like this crowd needs to be hooping and hollering to let those people know we're having a good time in here. That's true. Well, you know, that, I don't think that's a sign of, uh, of anything to come, you know, for the day. So Fair enough. But I think that's about all the time that we have for today. So I just want to thank everybody for, uh, for coming out uh, today uh, and for you guys for joining me up here. Absolutely. And um, I tell you what, everybody, just enjoy Oshkosh. Enjoy being back.